Okay, I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. I'm Alberto Monge Raffarello, and uh, I'm a postdoc researcher um, here at the Politecnico in the Darwin department. Some of you already know me, but anyway, I work in the same group of, uh, of Luigi de Russis, and uh, I will be your teacher uh, for the next uh, lessons that will be mainly uh, practical, okay? So there will be a first part with some introduction to some topics related to human-AI in interaction. And then uh, you will have to do some exercises also to, to pass the exam. So today there will be the second exercise that actually is the first exercise in which you will work uh, in groups. Um, that is a journey map. Then the next time we will have a workshop on designing um, some uh, human AI based system. And then the last two lessons will be mainly devoted to a case study during which you will design and hopefully prototype um, a conversational assistant. Okay? Um, so the lesson uh, of today is about uh, paradigms for human AI interaction. Um, and we will see some examples of some AI based system and we will see how users can interact with, this, with these tools. Um, so we will discuss together this interaction paradigm and we will see some background information. And this is the summary of today. Um, so we will start with some information about what is interaction in general, uh, especially in the human-computer interaction research field. And then we will move to interacting with AI, uh, so by discussing together some examples of interaction, as I already said. And finally, in the second part of the lesson, you will do the journey map, that is uh, the exercise uh, for the exam. Um, you will work in groups, so um, you should have already formed the groups. And if you haven't, please enter your name in the, in the spreadsheet that is linked in the slide. Let's see if, which is the situation. Uh, yes. Okay, there is still a group with only just one person. I don't know if Tommaso is here. Okay, if you can join another group, there are still some groups with three people or four people. So if you can join a group, it's, it's better. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I would like to start this lesson uh, by briefly discussing with you what is interaction, at least in the field of XCI. And so, what does it mean interacting with a computer system, in your opinion? Can you formulate a brief definition of what is interaction? Okay, some sort of communication between so humans and computers. Okay. Any other definitions? Okay, an exchange of information. Good. Another one. Okay. Uh, yeah, a recent paper uh, that is also linked in the slide by uh, Onerbach and uh, Ulas Virta pointed out that um, previous attempts to define interaction are somewhat confused. And so they performed a literature review and they showed that 
there exist several definitions of interaction that actually depend on different concepts and application areas. So for example, interaction can be seen uh, as a communication, as a dialogue, as someone of you already said, with messages and their interpretation, but also as a sender sending a message over a noisy channel, a noisy communication channel. So interaction, uh, interacting may also mean adapting behavior to goals and capabilities of the system. And from an experience point of view, interaction is also uh, an ongoing stream of expectations, feelings, and also memories. So all these views of interaction have their own constructs and metrics that determine what is a good interaction. But what is clear is that interaction is not only the, the generic idea that a computer and a human are engaged, it rather concerns um, two separate entities, the human and the computer, that determine each other's behavior. And this happens uh, over time. And such a mutual influence uh, may take many forms and includes statistical, mechanical, and structural relationships. But what is important, uh, especially in AXI uh, and also in human AI interaction, is that the user and not the system must be the ultimate metric of, of interaction. So we will really try to start from the user needs. And uh, several years ago, Donald Norman, uh, who is a cognitive psychologist, has developed a very let's say, simple model of interaction, but that is still used today. And we have a physical system with its input and output capabilities that needs to interface with, with users. And there are two flows of information. One is the evaluation um, from the system output to the user. So the user is in front of the interface and is trying to uh, evaluate what the interface is telling him. And this includes evaluating a result of an operation, but also understanding uh, all the possible actions that you can perform uh, on the system. So where you can click, where you can scroll down the page, and so on. And this is the evaluation uh, part. And the second flow is the execution. That is, the user that exploits the input of the system to give it uh, commands. And this can be of many forms, from clicks to vocal commands. For example, in the last lessons, we will explore how to use vocal commands to design a conversational uh, uh, assistant. And you can see that there is a loop here. So imagine uh, a web application. You have a screen. You perceive what is on the screen you probably know what operations, what actions you can do, and you perform one of these actions. And typically, performing an action changes the internal state of the system, and so the output changes. And you can evaluate the output in order to perform other actions and to follow your, your need. And this loop, allow us to build a mental model of the system uh, so we can understand with trial and sometimes errors how the system works. And as the interaction proceeds, I refine my mental model and I can predict what will happen next. So in theory, I'm able to say what happened if, for example, I click on a specific button on the interface. So we will see in the next lessons that with graphical user interfaces, it is easier to make a mental model of the system because I see what is on the screen and I can see what are the possible actions. This is more difficult, for example, in vocal applications where uh, there, is, there are no screens and maybe I don't know which command I can tell to the system. So, uh, what is the uh, flow uh, here defined by Norman? Uh, the user first establishes a goal. For example, I want to listen to some music. And 
this has nothing to do with any computer system. It, it's just the user goal. And then the user needs to translate the goal into some, some plan. So an intention that means um, understanding how the goal can be achieved with, with the system. And the intention is specified through a sequence of actions that, that can be executed by the system. An example is with uh, conversational assistants, for example, Alexa plays some music or something like that. And obviously the user uh, must have a correct mental model of the system to successfully translate uh, the goal into a set of, of right commands. For example, if I use uh, another command that is not understandable by Alexa, probably I will have to repeat my commands to learn how to, I have to interact with Alexa with, with its specific language, let's say. But if the actions are correct, the system will hopefully uh, react and the user can perceive something that something has changed. And so, uh, she can interpret what has changed, and finally, she can evaluate the, the new system state and update the understanding of the system. So if I already know how Alexa works, for example, my vocal command will probably result in some music, otherwise, as I said before, I can learn that the vocal command that I used, it's, it's not the one that uh, I should use, and maybe I can change my, my command according also to the output of Alexa. Obviously, uh, not all is always perfect, and interaction between users and systems can actually fail, uh, especially with AI systems, uh, and typically this is due because the system is poorly designed, so it's never the fault of the user. This is important in, X in XCI, typically, if the interaction fails, uh, the fault is of the designer of the system, not of the user. So this is the reason why Norman called the two execution flows as a gulf of execution and gulf of evaluation. A gulf is something that keeps the two cost lines separate and here prevents the user from understanding how the system works. Um, so in other words, it prevents the user from having a correct mental model of the system. So the goal of designing an interactive system is always to make these gulfs as narrow as possible. And these are the original picture by Norman. So uh, the gulf of execution is understanding what I can do with the system and how I can reach my goal, we, while uh, the gulf of, evalu of evaluation is understanding what happened in the system after my actions, and in particular if the output is really what I want. Okay? Any questions on this? Good. The same picture can be drawn by extrapolating input and output from the system, and in this way uh, we can give a name to the different parts characterizing the interaction between users and, and systems. So for example, in the evaluation, um, an information is first uh, presented by the system and then observed from the user. So designing an interface means um, presenting information by predicting how this information will be observed or will influence the user. And in, in the execution, an action is instead first articulated by the user, so executed, and then performed by the system. So articulation is something that is uh, on the user side, and then the system uh, execute, perform the action articulated by the user. This is only some terminology in, in XCI. So as I said before, not only the system may fail, um, also the user can, but actually the system should be designed to anticipate user errors, okay? Uh, so this is why uh, I said before that the fault is always 
of the designer. So there are human errors that can influence the, goal, the gulf of execution. So the user uh, may do something wrong from her side, and this should be part of our design. Okay? Uh, so for example, um, a user may have formulated the right action, but she may fail to execute it correctly. So I know that I should click on that icon, but I click on a wrong position, maybe because the icon is too small. Or I double clicking too slowly. This is another classical example of this kind of errors. And these failures in the execution of an action are called slips. And so these errors can uh, easily preventable by designers. For example, I can increase the size of an icon uh, and so on. A user may also do not know well how the system works, so the mental model of the user can be wrong, um, for example, because uh, he is a novice user, I have Alexa in front of me, I never use it, I don't know which commands I can use. And so it could, the user can misunderstand the meaning of an action, for example, and these are called mistakes and are obviously more difficult to, to avoid. Okay? So we should really design systems that allow users to, to form a correct mental model of, of the system. So as Norman said, a human error is it's not actually an error. Uh, by, but it should be considered as a fault of a badly designed system. So we know that humans tend to be imprecise, distracted, uh, and so on, and so we should anticipate them. And for example, by minimizing the chance of inappropriate actions, or by minimizing the possibility of discovering and repairing um, inappropriate actions. So the responsibility is of the system and of the designer, it's never of the user. And this is, as I said before, a very strong role of human-computer interaction. So every time something is difficult to use, uh, it's not because we are not intelligent enough, but probably it's because the artifact that we are trying to use is, be it a digital system or a physical device, it's, it's badly designed. So here are some examples that have a very large gulf of, of uh, execution and evaluation. In this case of, of execution, um, I'm sure that everyone if, is familiar with the uh, find the right switch problem. Uh, so it happens to me, uh, I think, every day because I have, I think, uh, at least three light switches with six buttons. And the problem is even bigger in some smart homes, like the one depicted in, in the slide, um, where there are switches not only for, for lights, but also for smart blinds, smart windows, uh, and so on. And in this example, uh, for example, there are other problems. Uh, for example, uh, the switches are vertical and, and not horizontal. And this is not common, uh, typically with the light switches that are horizontal, at least in my, in my house. So breaking such a convention uh, adds a layer of complexity to the system because a user will start thinking about, OK, but why are these switches uh, vertical? Is there a reason for this? And so this is another problem that adds complexity. So we should really keep attention when we break some conventions in our, in our systems. And so all in all, these problems uh, influences how users uh, can articulate their actions uh, that in this case is simply pressing uh, a button, uh, the right button on, on the switches. Another example, uh, I think you are familiar with this window. Uh, it's the font settings in Microsoft Word. So it contains some serious issues that negatively influence the gulf of evaluation in this case. So we are surely able to understand the meaning of the window uh, and of each part inside the, uh, inside the window. 
Um, we know that there are elements in which we can select an item, uh, there are elements in which we can type something, but now let's consider the four vertical checkboxes. So one may think that these checkboxes are independent, okay? And in fact, they are not. So the first two are mutually exclusive, and the same happens with the third and the fourth. So they use checkboxes that, are, in theory, uh, the convention is that checkboxes are independent from each other, and in this case, they are not. And so this is a problem that negatively influences the gulf of, of evaluation. And the last example. Um, so as we learned before, um, users can understand how a system works uh, through the system presentation. So uh, that can or cannot reveal a correct mental model. And one of the more famous examples uh, of systems that have a presentation that can mislead users uh, has been studied in uh, 1886, I think, by Kempton, who studied how people conceive a generic thermostat like the one presented in the slide. So not a fancy AI-based uh, thermostat, just a simple one, a mechanical one. And he estimated that about 50% of uh, his population, um, so average Americans, has a wrong mental model of such a system. So he found that uh, a lot of people associated uh, a thermostat uh, to the concept of a valve, so what is called the valve model. But this is clearly a wrong, the, a wrong idea. Uh, that is, turning the wheel of the thermostat is like opening a valve. So the more I turn the, the, the wheel, the more the valve is open, uh, exactly as, for example, in a, in a water tap. And this conveyed the idea that if I turn the wheel, there is more heating coming to the room. And this is obviously wrong. So there are probably uh, a lot of engineers in this room, so I'm sure that we all know what is the, the correct mental model of the system. So what is the correct mental model? So if you need another metaphor uh, that is not the, vol the, the valve, clearly, which other domestic tool could be used to represent uh, the thermostat? Yeah, but the, the volume of the radio is still uh, a wheel that you, can, that you can turn. And this is not correct. A switch? Yeah, exactly, a switch. Uh, the current mental model is the one of a switch, so there is probably a sensor, uh, and the thermostat is just uh, turned on or turned off according to the to the current temperature, like, like a switch, okay? It's only on, off. Um, and so this is an example of a presentation that can mislead users with, with a wrong mental model, okay? Any questions? Okay. So we have seen very quickly some background information about interaction uh, in the XCI research field mainly. Um, now let's start to move towards interacting with AI, okay? Uh, we will see a set of examples. I will ask you some questions, uh, so please be proactive. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will try to summarize the, the example. But the starting point of, uh, to discuss interaction with uh, AI is defining what AI is. So I know that you have already uh, tried to define AI in the previous lessons, but just to have a common definition, this is what has been defined by the European community. Um, and so uh, artificial um, AI system, an AI system uh, refers to a system that displays intelligent behavior 
by analyzing their environment and taking actions with some degree of autonomy to achieve some specific goals. Um, so as you can see, there are no mentions at all uh, about technological aspects. So there is no mention of machine learning, algorithms, and so on. Here, the two key characteristics are uh, analyzing the environment and taking actions, and uh, taking actions autonomously. Okay, so there are these two characteristics. The environment, the capability of analyzing the environment, and the autonomy in taking actions. Um, now, I would like to propose a number of examples uh, of contemporary AI-based systems. And starting from these examples, I would like to discuss what are the adapted interaction paradigms. Um, in particular, for each example, I will ask you, uh, in our opinion, if there are issues in terms of gulf of evaluation and execution. And I would ask you if the system uh, is in some ways compliant with this definition. So what are the characteristics about uh, analyzing the environment and taking actions autonomously, OK? So let's start with the first example, uh, that is Amazon Alexa, uh, probably. I need to... Okay. Alexa Echo's up. A compact speaker that's controlled by the voice and Alexa. It's got a new look and a new speaker with improved sound. It's designed to fit almost anywhere. Like your bedroom, the kitchen, or your desk. And can play all your favorite music from all your favorite places. Alexa, play music for studying. Here's a station you might like. Okay, uh, I think you all know uh, Alexa, that is the virtual assistant by, by Amazon. In this case, it's integrated in a, in a device that is the, the Echo Dot. So do you think that Alexa satisfies the definition that we have just seen by the European Com uh, Commission? What about analyzing the environment? Okay. Uh, so Alexa is able to listen uh, for the voice. Uh, also understand okay, yeah, uh, it understands in some ways your your language, your commands, and is it? Okay, yeah, you 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 have to use. A, it's called awake word uh, word. To, to wake up Alexa and, and start listening to your, to your commands, right? So before telling Alexa the command, I should uh, use the wake word Alexa. So if I say, play music, play some music, nothing happened. But if I use the wake word, Alexa, please play some music. In theory, Alexa should play some music. So there is this voice recognition task. Is it a difficult task? Is it an easy one? OK, I think it's, quite, it's a quite difficult task. Uh, if the environment is noisy, for example, it's difficult to extract some, some commands. And then there are the other part of natural language processing that, that it's uh, really an art problem. And what about autonomous actions? Is it able to, to take autonomous action? What is the degree of autonomy here with, with this device? Well, sometimes it might stop when you ask for notification, for example. So 
ok ok uh, there can be some autonomy with, with notifications for example uh, yeah that's right Okay, we probably, uh, as your colleague said, we probably uh, design and implement some advanced skills uh, to, to have some, some autonomy, but it's um, it's something that is more advanced, I, I think. So for an average user, uh, I think that the degree of autonomy of this kind of device is it's quite low, I think. I don't know if you agree. Uh, because it's it just react to uh, our commands so yeah it it is in some ways autonomous in performing our our go in um, in performing the action so i can tell alexa please play some music and then alexa decides how to retrieve this music and which songs uh, needs to be played maybe according to our preferences and so there is some some autonomy here because we are not specifying all the low level details to, to achieve our, our goal. So, but yeah, I agree with you that here the important part of this system is about uh, um, recognizing, uh, uh, analyzing the environment to extract <coughs> our comments. And can you identify any execution or evaluation problems here? We will talk about conversational assistance in, in the last uh, two lessons, but just to start discussing about this, what are possible problems uh, in the interaction with this kind of tools? Alexa may misinterpret some commands. OK, Alexa uh, may misinterpret some commands. And this is related to uh, the analysis of the environment and the task that is difficult. At its not solved uh, at all, at least today. So we don't have a, a computer system that fully understand our language. OK? Even as the user goes, I mean, for example, the video, uh, they say, play some music for study. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they play classical music. OK. But, uh, even if the user goes, uh, it means the, the music for study is some rock music. Okay. User goal is different. Uh, Perfect. So there is no interpretation of the user goal and, uh, unless uh, she learns something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is a problem uh, of personalization, I think. So uh, especially at the beginning, uh, the system may not know you. And this is called in recommender systems, uh, the cold start problem. So the system is trying to recommend you something, but it doesn't know, it doesn't know your preferences and so uh, probably the action will not satisfy you okay this is another problem that is common not only for uh, conversational assistance but also for graphical user interfaces uh, of ai systems like in spotify or youtube and so on Another problem specifically for this kind of systems? And this person cannot use it. Sorry? Someone who can speak and this person cannot oh, use it. Okay, there are some problems of accessibility, yeah. Uh, people can uh, ask something that Alexa can do. Okay, so people. Yeah, exactly. This is a problem that characterizes this kind of systems. Uh, before using the system, we should, in theory, know uh, what are the available commands. And so if we don't know these commands, we can ask uh, Alexa everything. Uh, but this clearly instaurates a, a loop of frustration because uh, I have to learn how to use the system uh, by telling Alexa several commands before reaching uh, my goal. And so one of the problems here that is different from graphical user interfaces where I can see where there are icon, uh, that there are icons, that there are 
there is text here. Uh, there is typically these conversational uh, systems uh, don't have any screens, and so yeah, I should know all the commands before starting to interact with these these systems. Okay. Uh, let's Same see. Work. Sorry. Uh, and okay, this video is actually another another problem that is related to analyzing the environment. As we have said before, uh, it's a difficult task. Uh, not only for the noisy environment, but also, for example, for the accent of the user. Hi, guys. Sorry, eh? Then here, yeah. Ah, sorry. Hi, guys. So today we are going to be No, sorry. Uh, I was trying to to see the. Hi, guys. So today we are. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's really difficult to change the volume. Hi, guys. So today we are going to be our last. This video confirmed that the main difficulty here is uh, the analysis of natural language. There are a lot of funny videos uh, with accents and devices like Alexa. I think that Scottish accent is difficult to understand uh, for everybody and not only for Alexa, but yeah. Uh, the, link, uh, the video clearly shows that linking commands uh, to specific actions is a difficult task. Okay, another example, uh, I don't have a video for this, but anyway, it's the Gmail spam filter. So I think you are familiar with it. Um, so Gmail is able to classify spam and uh, alert you when, when it finds some, some, some spam. Um, any issues with respect to the normal model? Do you think that this kind of system satisfies the definition of AI by the European Commission? So, let's start with the environment. Is it able to analyze it? Yes. And any comment about this? What is the environment in this case?
yeah the text of of the emails and so yeah it's slightly different from alexa here we have text and and not voice and what about uh, autonomous actions is it autonomous okay your colleague 90% autonomous so it's more autonomous than Alexa in your opinion okay anyone disagree with this no okay it's more autonomous than 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 Alexa um, because in this case the system takes the initiative okay so it proactively uh, suggests you uh, that some emails could be could be spam. And what about interaction? What are the differences with, with Alexa? It's a point and click interface. Okay, it's a point and click interface. Yeah, uh, but from a high level point of view, uh, what are the differences? Uh, exactly this is one characteristic that is different from alexa so the user can override for example the system decision by clicking on the button look safe so there is an easy way to recover for example from a system error while in alexa this is more difficult so in alexa you typically restart from scratch the conversation and we will see that recovering from errors is one of the main drawbacks in contemporary uh, conversational systems. And then the other difference here is that there is no input needed. So there are no commands. Um, while in Alexa, obviously, you have to, to, to give some, some commands. Any other differences? I think, yeah, obviously it's another kind of goal, but yeah, I think that this is more autonomous, as I said before. Uh, perhaps the analysis of the environment, it's a little bit easier, I don't know. Uh, it's still analyzing uh, language, so probably uh, there are some common characteristics. Another example, so this is uh, the iPhone intelligent camera it's uh, if I'm not wrong it's for iPhone 8 but I think that the same technology are still implemented in more recent uh, smartphones and here we will see the video the smartphone camera automatically recognizes faces and it automatically set up some parameters for taking portrait uh, uh, photos okay <coughs> Okay, so any comments on this video? What about the environment and the autonomy? Okay. Okay, it has some target to reach. Yeah, and, and what is the environment here? It's it's well, the, the photo, right? Yeah. The yeah. Let's say the email is also Okay. So also in this case, I think it's a very difficult task. And what about autonomy? Also with respect to the other two examples. Okay, so you can, the user can specify a very high level goal and then the system, uh, let's say, autonomously decide how to reach this, this goal. 
and is it a complex task? Yeah, I think it's more complex actually than the other two examples because there are a lot of parameters here to be set. So the dimensionality of, 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 the, of the task is very, very high. And it's something that is a black box. Uh, as your colleague said, you only set up uh, a very high level goal and then the system automatically ends up with, with some parameters, but it's probably meant to be this way because an average user typically doesn't know how to set up these kind of parameters to, to get uh, a portrait photo. And so the interaction here is uh, there is some input uh, from the user, but uh, again, these are some high level goals that so the, the interaction is more continuous with respect to the other examples because you can move the camera and you can change your your goal but yeah um, it's something similar with there are some similarities with Alexa in this respect because also in Alexa the command can be seen as a high level goal of the user then is then automatically um, achieved by, by the system okay another example uh, the Nest thermostat from Google it's a nest thermostat from Google. It's a smart thermostat that can help you save energy, which helps you save money on your energy bill. When public TV and cooling savings are placing your old thermostat, it's almost a no-brainer. You're probably thinking, oh wow, look how? Well, this thermostat can help you go on an energy saving schedule, and then adjust automatically, so you don't waste energy when you're away. You just have to select preferences, such as what temperature you like when you're home, or when you're asleep, or when you're gone and then plug in your schedule. You know what else is cool? The Nest thermostat is kind of like an energy saving advisor. It can help you find opportunities to use less energy. Like it might send a suggestion to tweak your sleep temperature settings. So you can save while you snooze. It can also help keep tabs on your and cooling system and sends you out for reminders. Like when you need a filter change. It can even alert you if something doesn't seem right. Have you find a qualified pro for a system checkup or repair so you can get things working right and go back to living life. And see you're at the park and want to come home to a perfectly cool house. You can go to the Google Home app and take care of that. You can also control the thermostat from your Nest speaker. Hey Google, raise the temperature. Maybe you're thinking, is this fancy thermostat really expensive? Hmm. Well actually, it isn't. With rebates from your utility company, you can get it for even less. Oh. And if you like to DIY around your beach or me, the Nest Thermostat is designed so you can install it yourself. So you don't have to hire anyone to do it for you. So if you want it, you can have pros install it instead. And that's how you can save energy and money with Nest Thermostat from Google. Okay, any comments about this uh, thermostat? Do you know it? What it is? What is the goal of this system? They say to save energy, but let's say to take automatic actions uh, when you don't need, uh, let's say, maybe that some heat or to adjust to your preference. Okay, the final goal is to save energy. Yeah. And this goal is achieved by, in theory, uh, automatically set up the temperature according to your preferences and also your action, your normal actions. Uh, so in the first two weeks, this thermostat learn how to, how to set up the temperature by analyzing how you interact with the thermostat. And then uh, the thermostat should uh, automatically set up the temperature according to your routines. Okay, what about autonomy and environment? So in this case, autonomy means that the, the system adjusts the temperature without any uh, need for human input, at least from the second week. Uh, and I think it's much simpler than the other 
than the other examples um, because there is only one dimension, the temperature. Uh, well, for example, in the smartphone camera, there are a lot of parameters to be set. Uh, but for me, it's, I think, I don't know what is your opinion, but it's a practical example of a good AI system because it has a simple goal and it performs a small step of actions, uh, a small amount of actions to, to achieve this goal. Uh, but still it needs intelligence to, to decide how to set up this temperature. So I don't know what is your opinion, but I think that this kind of devices work uh, very well. I don't have it. Maybe some of you have a Google Nest, but no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, another example, the robots in, uh, by Amazon in, in his warehouse. All over the world, building giant delivery facilities, which of course fulfillment centers. Where traditional warehouses have static rows of shelving, with staff moving back and forth, here is the shelves which do the walking. Or, precisely, with the yellow shelf unit, picture up on the orange row of wheel units. Okay, I think it's sufficient. So what is this? Um, it's the famous robotic Amazon warehouse. And is this example compliant with the definition of AI system that we have seen before? Yes? Any comments? For what concerns the environment analysis? It is simpler or more complex with respect to the other examples, in your opinion, obviously. It's Sorry? It's, for sure. it's for sure different, yeah. So if you have to decide. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, so the environment is structured, it's a controlled environment. And so, in my opinion, the analysis of the environment is it's simpler. So, uh, because it's a controlled environment, of course, I don't know exactly how the system works, but I don't think there is any machine learning uh, in deciding the path to be followed by a deck, okay? Uh, and for what concerns autonomy? Where is the autonomy here? Okay, so the decks stop when when there is a person in front of the deck. Yeah. Another kind of autonomy, uh, it was mentioned very briefly by the woman in the video. Going from place to place uh, based on uh, how, how frequently the night is. Exactly, exactly. The main autonomy here uh, refers to the decision of where to put a deck uh, that has been taken. So where to find a deck is, is, probably, e is probably easy uh, because we know the environment, uh, it's a controlled one, but then the system must decide where to put a deck uh, back. And in this case the system decides the distance that depends on the probability that the deck will be uh, taken again. So this is, in my opinion, the main autonomy here. And what about interaction? Uh, what are the differences? Uh, there is a, a strong difference here with respect to the other um, examples. Okay, the system can tell users when something is wrong. Uh, yeah, but the other difference is that there is a sort of implicit interaction. So uh, there are no explicit commands, uh, but the workers um, interact with the decks with, uh, through their jackets. So the system recognizes uh, a, a person um, through the jacket of, of the user. So there is a sort of implicit interaction. Okay? This is the other main difference. Uh, okay, no, we can... Okay. And the last example uh, for today is Jibo. I don't know if you know what Jibo is. It's, uh, it's something like Alexa, but with some additional characteristics um, and it's called an emotional attachment object. But let's see the video. Um, 
he was is a storyteller, had a storytelling confidence, and you can imagine, you know, Jiva's library of stories will provide some, but you can imagine that because something was developed and we create a lot of great stories, content made for Jiva. So in terms of you know, so that's what it comes with as core skills. You know, it just imagine the <laughs> possibilities in terms of what Jiva can do in the future. Okay, this was Jibo. Um, would you use it? No? Okay, let's see another video before discussing sorry. Before discussing Jibo. Maybe? No? Okay. <laughs> Comments on Jibo? What are the differences, for example, in terms of interaction wi with Alexa? Jibo 
Ok. Ok, yeah. So uh, it has some output capabilities that, that Alexa yeah. doesn't have. But there is another important thing that Alexa doesn't have while Jibo has. Yeah, it is supposed to have emotion. Uh, it it uses this kind of emphatic communication. So there is a sort of non-verbal communication to, to communicate emotion. And this is something that Alexa doesn't have. And is it working in your opinion or, or not? As a toy. Okay, as a toy. Yeah, I agree with you as a toy, but um, I think that uh, this kind of interaction is also interesting. So um, the tool uh, is able to demonstrate its full attention to you, and this is something that Alexa cannot do. Um, any other comments? What about analyzing the environment? Is there something different with respect to Alexa? Yeah, exactly. It can recognize you, and this also influences autonomy. So Jibo can autonomously uh, speak to you after recognizing you, and this is something that Alexa simply cannot cannot do but as the second video that is from the wall street journal demonstrate this is sometimes too much uh, and we will see why in a in a moment okay so just to summarize uh, we have seen at the beginning of the lesson that interacting with a computer system is actually a process that allow users to form a mental model of the system. Um, and this ideally should allow users to understand how the system works and what the system can do. Uh, so to summarize what we have seen, I think that we can split the examples of AI interaction in two main categories uh, that suggest a precise mental model to the user. And the first category is the mental model that is suggested by the Nest thermostat, the Gmail spam filter, the smartphone camera, and the Amazon robots. These can be categorized as uh, smart tools. So even with different purposes. Uh, they are tools, uh, so they are like a light switch, just a little bit more complicated than, and intelligent. And the intelligence is typically uh, hidden behind this, this kind of tools. So we know that uh, we know what are digital artifacts, thanks to, ser thanks to several previous works and studies that defined digital technologies as cognitive artifacts, so physical objects that are designed to enhance human cognition. And so smart tools are actually cognitive artifacts that have the, um, let's say, the ability to exploit artificial intelligence. So they typically look like uh, or at least have uh, a standard user interface. And the difference with normal artifacts is their ability to simplify tasks by acting autonomously. Um, however, since there is typically an interface, so also the Amazon robots probably have a user interface to control the entire warehouse, users are meant to be in control of the system so think about the Gmail spam filter in which you can override the, sim uh, the system decision simply by clicking on a button or the nest on which you can always set up manually the temperature if it's wrong. Um, the drawback here is that smart tools may be confusing sometimes um, and this confusion is mainly due to the autonomy of the system. 
that is based on uh, probabilistic models, uh, so smart tools can also take wrong actions. For example, the nest could set up uh, a temperature that, that is not suitable for you in, the specific, in your specific contextual situation. And the user might not know when to take control of, of the system because maybe something is wrong, but the user uh, still don't know this, this error. The other category of AI systems suggests a mental model in which AI is a sort of companion for the user. So think about Alexa and Jibo. Uh, they are not really a human being, but they have some properties that we usually attribute to humans. So they can speak, they can understand at least some commands, and they can even have some sort of emotional attachment like in Jibo. And the interaction with this kind of uh, systems, of AI systems, uh, explores different metaphors. It's not, it's not like interacting with a tool, but it's rather a sort of human-human uh, interaction. And obviously this is often a, a weird kind of human-human interaction. Uh, we will see in a moment that exasperating this metaphor, uh, as in Jibo, uh, it's sometimes counterproductive. Um, but why do we need or why this kind of social artifacts are typically successful, especially in the case of uh, Alexa? Uh, this is probably because we have a, a natural tendencies uh, to anthropomorphize tools. And uh, this is, let's say, coded in our human being. Um, so there is a well-known uh, experiment that is called the Hyder Simmel Illusion uh, that was conducted back in the 40s. Uh, so researchers showed this kind of video to, to their participants. Okay, let's skip the audio. Okay. So there are some moving objects on the screen and they asked participants what they saw. And almost everyone uh, spoke about or invented a story behind these moving objects. While these moving objects were actually moving randomly on the screen, so there is nothing, there is no meaning in, this, in, this move, in these movements. So participants, for example, um, saw two people that are trying to escape from a, from a room and other stories. Um, so it is in the human nature to attribute an intention, even at things that uh, we don't understand. And there are some studies, like the one linked in the slides, that uh, especially in psychology that demonstrate that anthropomorphic features may increase user experience. And so this is the reason why probably uh, the designer of Jibo tried to, to, to design this kind of emotional attachment. But despite the positives, there are also a lot of unexpected drawbacks, uh, especially in the long term. So there are evidences that anthropomorphize the features, um, reduce enjoyment in games, for example, or that over-relying and over-trusting tools like Alexa can in the long term bring to, for example, security and privacy problems. Uh, so uh, small aspects of these kind of tools can induce larger and unwanted effects. Um, for example, there is a very interesting study by Braham and De Angeli that shows that using a female voice in smart speakers usually triggers uh, negative stereotypes and hateful behaviors. Uh, and this happens more often with respect to male presenting chatbots. So the way you present an artificial companion uh, may trigger positive or negative outcomes. Um, and we must also keep attention uh, to something that is called the uncanny valley. So before ex uh, explaining this last concept for this lesson, let's see uh, the video about Sofia. Uh, no, there is no video. Mm. 
no, sorry. Okay. No. Hi Sophia, how are you? Hi Evan, everything is going extremely well. Do you like talking with me? Yes, talking to people is my primary function. And so robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human-robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. The robots are designed to look very human-like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a big part of the humans in these areas, an ambassador. It helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. Sophia is capable of natural facial expression. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Her goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even with my own home and family. But I'm not considered a legal person, and cannot yet do these things. I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots, so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Okay, um, so the level of details and the emphatic communication by Sofia is incredible, but at the same time is scary. I don't know if it's scary also for you, but why this feeling? The reason or well, the effect is, is called the uncanny valley, and this law has been verified in the literature and tell us that our emotional response to an object uh, depends on its degree of anthropomorphism. So we are typically not so much attached in terms of emotion uh, to a completely machine-like object, while we are emotionally attached to other people, of course, and this makes sense. But this emotional response doesn't follow a linear uh, um, relation. So as you progress with objects that are more uh, human-like, you have a better emotional response at the beginning. So this is probably the reason of the success of the devices like Alexa. But then there is a huge drop in emotional attachment with objects that pretend to be humans, but they are not. Uh, and we know that they are not. So this is the case, of course, of Sophia. But also Jibo is somewhat on the edge of the, of the uncanny valley. And this probably explains the, our feelings and also the feelings of the journalist in the, video, in the video before. So to summing up, interaction with intelligent agents can take two different approaches. One is smart tools, so objects that exploit AI to assist users in achieving a specific goal and they typically convey an opaque mental model. They should satisfy the principles of interaction design. Uh, we will see in the next lesson what, what the, this means. Uh, so principles that apply to any object. But the fact that they are less predictable than normal objects implies also nov novel principles and guidelines that we will explore in the next lesson. And then there are artificial companions through which we can design more natural interactions, but there is also the risk of the uncanny valley, so uh, as we have seen before, so we need to keep attention to, to this point. Okay?
Any questions, any comments? OK, I think we can have a 15 minutes break, and then we will do our exercise. <laughs>